Well, I completely forgot what happened in the last chapter. Because it was so long ago that I read. Right? It was so long ago. Something's not right. It's backwards. How come when I go on Instagram or like record myself with a front facing camera, it's, wait a minute, okay. Is this backwards? When I look at it, it's backwards. It's written backwards. I always forget. Is this written backwards for you? My tea doesn't taste very good. It's one of my favorite teas. Maybe there's too much water in it. And it's not hot anymore. It's not hot anymore. Put honey in it. And it's one of my favorite teas, but it doesn't taste great. Is this writing backwards for you? Because it is kind of like that. If I put something up that has to be read, I don't want it to be backwards. I can't read backwards. Hi. So I just read two chapters and it's getting quite exciting. We have three left. Hi. <laughs> All right, so. Um, what happened at the end? Uh, psst, Nancy, the, oh yeah, they're at the um, the big ski, uh, it's not a tournament because like they're just having games and stuff, events. Although the guy, the skiing guy went up and it's not a tournament. There's no, um, it's just for fun. And someone pretended, someone sent fake telegrams doesn't that happen quite a bit? That someone pretends to be Mr. Drew? Or like, tries to uh, use her father to thwart her detective work. Okay. Sometimes I wish they wouldn't put Roman numerals. Chapter 18, A Weird Light. Nancy looked anxiously about in hopes of seeing either Ned or one of her other friends, but none of them was in sight. John Horn tugged impatiently at her coat sleeve. I tell you, we've got to hurry, Nancy, he pleaded. She's over on that pond in the woods right now and skating around bold as you please. Who's skating, Nancy demanded. The fur coat lady who was in a movie. Why, that woman who sold me the fake fur stock. The old trapper snorted. That thieving Mrs. Channing, of course. At the name Channing, Nancy hesitated no longer. Lead the way, she urged. An instant later, the two were running across the hotel grounds. They headed into the woods at the rear of the inn and trudged through the snow for nearly a quarter of a mile. There she is, Horn pointed out. They slowed down and cautiously approached a small cleared pond. Nancy felt a tingle of excitement run down her spine. She stood on tiptoe for a better view and craned her neck. As Mitzi Adele ended a series of figures, she was facing Nancy directly. The tall, slender brunette suddenly realized she had been discovered. Like a flash, she shot back she shot back toward the far bank. Without removing her skates, she raced off among the trees. Fool, said John Horn. She'll break an ankle. And that is the picture. Please, um, no, no. It says, fool, she'll break an ankle. Nancy and the old guy. And there's Mitzi Adele in the back. He was already taking snowshoes from his back and quickly fastened them onto his boots. Looks like it's going to be a race, he observed. You follow as fast as you can, Nancy. He soon outdistanced Nancy, 
who had tried sliding across the ice to save time. Nancy has a lot of talents, but apparently snowshoeing is not one of them. But she had fallen twice and wasted precious minutes. Some distance ahead, the trapper saw Mitzi. She was seated on a log and had just finished changing into hiking boots. She leaped to her feet and fled farther into the woods, but the old trapper was gaining with every step. Nancy found their trail and sped after them as fast as she could through the deep snow. Suddenly, she heard a scream followed by, Let me go! A moment later, she came in view of Mitzi and the trapper. The woman was kicking and scratching John Horn as he held her firmly by one arm. Mitzi's eyes blazed with anger. I'll have you arrested for this, she panted. Oh, no, you won't, Mrs. Channing, called Nancy, running up. We're going to turn you over to the police. Mitzi glared. Why, if it isn't little Miss Detective herself, she sneered. And what have I done? A great deal, Mitzi Channing. You've been selling fake stock certificates and you've stolen furs and jewelry. That should be enough. That stock is perfectly good, Mitzi snapped and I've never stolen anything. If this big, if this, if this big gorilla will just let go, she added, trying to twist away from the trapper's grasp. Where's your husband, Nancy demanded, and where's Dunstan Lake? What? <laughs> I don't know how to say that. She says, can you see it? Can you see it? I don't know where it is. What? The startled woman flung her flung back her head. <laughs> As she did so, her cap, loosened by her struggles, fell to the ground, disclosing a pair of sparkling earrings. The old lady's earrings. They were shaped like small arrows with diamonds at each tip. Those are Mrs. Packer's stolen earrings, Nancy charged. They are not, they're mine, Mitzi retorted. Then suddenly she clamped her lips tightly together and refused to say another word. Nancy, there's a couple of state troopers at the hotel, said John Horn. If you'll hurry back and get them, I'll march our prisoner along and meet you halfway. Well, I don't know if you can see it because I, I can't, I can hold it like this. And if you see it, you see it. And if you don't, you don't because it's covering the screen for me. It's in italics and it's W-H dash A-T question mark. What? I'll march our prisoner along and meet you halfway. I'll bring them as fast as I can, Nancy promised and started off on a run. I guess she's doing better with her snowshoes all of a sudden. I need to microwave my uh, tea because I was gone longer than I expected. Okay, I'm gonna be right back. I promise.
I'm back. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun reading. I should have started reading a while ago. Well, I was at my desk and I wasn't plugged in, so it didn't, um, my battery died. So I'm plugged in here, so everything's okay. <sighs> my tea tastes so much better now. <sighs> I have to get new pillows at home. I've needed to for a long time. I'm just lazy. Or it's more fun to buy heart sunglasses and things. Um, remind me, I need to buy new pillows for my bed and uh, darker curtains. Like, not black, well, blackout curtains, but they have to be cute, too. Mmm. I thought of some good curtains. Very important. That would be helpful for sleeping and stuff. Things that are actually going to improve my quality of life. Snowshoes. Whoops, there we go. Remind me to drink my tea. I get excited about the book and I forget about other stuff. You know what I mean? Okay. Right, she started off on a run. She planned to tell her aunt and the others about the capture, but met the troopers first and decided to wait until the prisoner was in custody. She told her story quickly and led the officers toward the spot where she had left the captive and John Horn. For an old guy, he seems pretty, um, I'm not sure, pretty physically fit and good at, you know, doing stuff, stopping people for an oldster. Well, they don't say how old he is. But don't they call him an old guy or something? And he looks kind of old in the picture, I guess. <clears throat> but when they arrived, there was no sign of Mitzi Channing. Oh, uh, forget everything I just said. They saw only the limp body of John Horn lying unconscious on the snow with a large welt behind one ear. Okay. Oh, Mitzi <laughs> cried in horror. Oh, you know what? I'm going to remind me to write down things I have trouble with, which is mostly when anyone yells out things like, oh, now I know she's crying in horror. It's usually Bess who yells out, oh, oh, Nancy cried in horror and knelt beside him. One of the troopers reached into his pocket for a tiny vial, nipped off the end and held the spirits of ammonia under John Horn's nose. Meanwhile, the other officer was inspecting the ground. He said that what had happened was plain. Footprints indicated that the trapper had been overpowered by two large men. Mitzi had vanished into the woods with her rescuers. Fortunately, John Horn was not badly hurt and revived within a few minutes. He explained that he had been jumped from behind and had not seen his attackers. But I think I can identify one of those men, Nancy told the trappers. He is named Channing, alias Jacques Fremont. Yep. One trooper immediately set out to trail the men while his partner hastened off to dispatch a radio alarm. Nancy and John Horn walked slowly. Probably the Wi Fi. Okay. It's probably the Wi Fi. Sometimes it goes nuts. Um, he needs no coddling, but. But Nancy insisted that he take a room at the hotel and have the house physician examine his injured head. Nancy's aunt and her young friends were greatly upset by the incident. They concluded that the Forest Fur Company gang must be desperate. Nancy called state police headquarters, but there was no word about Mitzi or the men. Hmm. Where's uh, Carson? Oh. Why do I have my sound on? I accidentally put my sound on my phone. 
Did you hear a noise? I usually have it on silent. Oh, I remember why. I remember why I have my sound on. I'll just leave it on. I'm on the wrong page. Chuck Wilson was deeply concerned over his old friend and spent nearly an hour in John Horn's room. Because of this, he almost missed the special hunter's dinner, which the guests enjoyed immensely. The management had provided a hillbilly orchestra, which played old time ballads and lively polkas. Afterward, the tables and chairs were cleared away for a series of square dances. Nancy swung gaily through the grand right and left, then promenaded with Ned as her partner. Well, that's good. He's not hanging out with that pretty girl. When it was over, Chuck Wilson came to join them. I'm going upstairs again to see how old John is feeling, he said. Do you folks want to come? Oh, yes, Nancy answered. They found the trapper pacing the floor of his room like a caged bear. The doc won't let me get out of here till morning, he grumbled. You must think I'm a softy. Nothing of the sort, Nancy replied, and added affectionately, you probably saved my life, Mr. Horn. If I'd been standing guard over Mitzi, those men might have carried me off and dropped me down some snowy ravine. Don't talk like that, Ned said severely. While she had been talking, Nancy had walked to a window to gaze at the beautiful moonlit landscape. Suddenly, her attention was caught by a glimmer of light along the ridge at the top of Big Hill. A moment later, she could see the steady beam of a flashlight moving rapidly toward the ski run. It seemed very strange at this hour. Boys, she called, why would anyone be up near the top of the jump at night? I can't imagine, said Chuck, as he and Ned joined her at the window. Come on, let's find out. Hopefully Ned can do something impressive. The three young people waved a quick goodbye to the trapper and hurried downstairs to the check rooms. Hastily changing to ski clothes, they dashed outdoors. For a moment, there was no sign of the light. Then suddenly it showed up again at the top of the ski run and came hurtling downward as the unknown jumper soared expertly at the takeoff and landed below with a soft swish and a thud. Good night! Chuck cried. What a chance he took. Let's speak to him. He and Ned raced off into the darkness, for already the light had disappeared and a cloud had cut off the moonlight. Nancy waited until the cloud passed over, then tried to spot the jumper. She could not see him. Where could he have gone? She asked herself. That man wasn't just a phantom. He was flesh and blood. She turned toward the lake and the two giant snow statues, which marked the end of the ski jump. Nancy's heart pounded at the sight she saw. By a mere flicker of light that glowed, then vanished like a firefly, she could detect the shadowy outline of a crouching figure in a white sweater huddled behind the nearer statue. The person was cramming a bulky pouch into a hollow of the snowman. That's the cover. That's what's happening on the cover. But it doesn't look scary on the cover. It's just someone and a snowman. As Nancy opened her mouth to call Chuck and Ned, a rough hand was clapped over her face. Quiet, a harsh voice commanded. I don't try to run away or you'll get hurt. End of chapter 18. It's probably Mr. Channing, right? No, they were arrested. I don't know. It's very confusing. <laughs> what about that um, farmer guy who got robbed? What happened to him? I hope the old lady with the earrings is in again. She has stuff that she can give as a a gift, like a collectible at the end of the story. Maybe it'll be a fur coat or a baby mink. 
I check the length of the chapter. It's another short chapter. Chapter 20, I mean 19, zero hour. Thank you, Shelly. <laughs> there was no escaping from the man's iron grasp. With her captor's fingers firmly gripping both arms, Nancy stood helpless while the other man ran over from the statue. Roughly, he stuffed a handkerchief into her mouth, tied her hands behind her, and bound her ankles together. Then the two men carried her swiftly toward the woods. If only Ned or Chuck had seen me, Nancy thought. Here I am with friends so close by and I can't even call for aid. Although Nancy could not see the men's faces, in a few minutes she knew who her abductors were, for they began to talk freely. Uh, say, Jacques, how much farther is it to that cabin? The shorter of the pair asked. Jacques Fremont, the man whose other name was Channing. The man at the skating exhibition in Montreal. If only the police had not been obligated to release him. Stupid Montreal police. Just a little ways, Lake, he replied. Nancy caught her breath. So Dunstan Lake was a man, not a place. Wow, I never thought of that. Lake is also a last name. Veronica Lake, Ricky Lake, Dunstan Lake. Channing gave a sardonic laugh. All we need to do is dump the Drew girl inside and lock the door. The place probably won't be opened again until summer. What a relief to have her out of the way, growled his companion. We had an airtight racket until Miss Detective began snooping around, asking for the Channings and Dunstan Lake. Although how she found out where we were, I'll never know. She's clever, Channing admitted, but too clever for her own good. Now Miss Nancy Drew is going to pay for her smartness. Well, Lake, here we are. Suppose we see if this girl detective can solve the mystery of the locked cabin with both her hands and feet tied. Channing continued with a harsh laugh. The cabin was bitterly cold. Even worse than outdoors, Nancy thought, as her abductors flung her down on a bare cot. Then, in the glare of a flashlight, Dunstan Lake, a squarish man with a bulldog face and beady eyes, made a mocking bow. Goodbye, Miss Drew, he smirked. Happy sleuthing. Come along, let's get out of here. Channing snapped impatiently. It's time we picked up Mitzi at the camp. She'll be tired of waiting. Nancy shivered and closed her eyes despairingly as she heard the door slam and the padlock snap. She struggled to get out of her bonds, but it was useless. Already her fingers were becoming cold. With every passing minute, the cabin grew more frigid. It sounds nice to me. Nancy wondered desperately how long she could survive. Who do you think's gonna rescue her? Probably everyone will just break through the door. A whole bunch of people, not just one person. She knew that her only hope lay in exercise. She raised and lowered her bound ankles as high as she could until she was puffing with exhaustion. As she rested a moment, the fearful cold took possession of her again. Nancy decided to try rolling on the floor. She managed to get off the cot and in doing so loosened the gag in her mouth. Crying loudly for help, she waited hopefully for an answer. None came. She rolled, twisted, and yelled until she was bruised and hoarse. Finally, her voice gave out completely. Her strength was gone. She became drowsy and knew what this meant. The end. Her body was succumbing to the below freezing temperature. Cool boy. And now some incidental music. How about some music from The Shining? That's scary music. Meanwhile, back at the slope, Ned and Chuck had completed a futile search for the mysterious jumper and were now walking to the spot where they had left Nancy. They're way behind in the mystery. 
I can't figure out why that fellow took off at night, said Chuck. He could be arrested, you know. It's against all regulations. It was probably some crackpot who wanted to prove how brave he is, Ned shrugged. Say, Nancy's gone. I wouldn't worry, Chuck smiled. She probably was chilled and went back to the hotel. Not Nancy, Ned retorted. She never gives up. If Nancy's not here, it's for a good reason. She probably spotted one of those swindlers she's been looking for and is trailing him alone. Nevertheless, Chuck persuaded Ned to go back to the hotel to look for Nancy. She had not come in, Bess reported. What's going on? Tell you later, Ned called as he and Chuck dashed off. Oh, I hurt. <laughs> I hurt. Oh, gosh. The bird is loud, loud, loud. When they reached the ski slope, Chuck cried out, Look, somebody's coming down Big Hill again. Two men with flashlights. But those fellows are descending like sane men. Sane men, Ned observed. They aren't taking any jumps. The newcomers were state troopers. They said they were searching for the thief who again had stolen some mink pelts from the Wells Ranch. Chuck told them about the foolhardy jumper and they shook their heads in disgust. The men were about to go on when Ned stopped them. Have you seen a girl in a ski outfit? He asked. She was out here with us when we were looking for that crazy skier. Now she has disappeared and I'm afraid she's trailing the same thieves you are. Oh, stop screeching, Bertie. Oh, God. I would go insane. It's because he wants attention. He's not socialized, so you can't play with him. You can't take him out and play with him and cuddle him. I used to have cockatiels. They were hand fed as babies, so you could do playing with them. They came out all the time. And they didn't bite your fingers off. Thieves? Thieves? The troopers echoed. Yes, thieves, Ned went on. The girl is Nancy Drew, the one who captured that swindler, Mitzi Channing, this afternoon. But the woman got away. I heard about that over the police radio, one of the men said. We'd better help you hunt for your friend. She may be in danger. We haven't much chance of trailing anyone, the other remarked. There's been such a crowd around here. The place is full of tracks. How long has it been since you saw the young lady? About 20 minutes, Chuck answered. Then she can't be far away, said the younger trooper. I'm having trouble reading because of the screeching of the bird. I'm going to have to stop for now because this is not pleasant for me. So we'll finish later, okay? Thanks for joining me. I hope I wasn't too annoying with my being annoyed. Oh, oh I'm so sore. But it's better than like your bed falling apart while you're in it, right? I think so. Um, when the bird goes to sleep, I'm going to plan to come back. No time. But sometime today we will finish because there's only this much left. A bit of, we're almost finished at chapter 19 and then we have chapter 20. Okay, so thanks for joining me. I'll be back later.